My father died when I was 15. My brothers were very young then. And he had his barber shop on the infamous 25th Street, a really rowdy street, uh, a lot of beer halls and brothels. My mother, she didn't have a job. We had a kind of a family meeting and she says, you know, she says, she says uh, I've got a brother back in Japan and I'm sure that we could go live with him and we could get along okay back in Japan. And I told her, you know, feeling like I was a big shot. She was kind of consulting with me like, now that the, your dad's gone, you have to be the man of the family. And I told her, well, you take the kids and go, but I'm staying. <laughs> a 15 year old back in those days, and those were the depression days, you know, that was 1939. So we we're just coming out of the depression. And my folks, uh, they used to always say that you've got to be better than your parents. They said, first thing you have to go to school, get educated so that you can be better than your parents. And she says, you know, you gotta go to school. She says, I can't help you because I don't have the, you know, the means to do that. But she said, if you would go to Weber College here, which was just like three blocks up the street, says, uh, you could stay here and, uh, uh, and as long as you can find some way to pay your tuition and, and your books. I was taking engineering courses, which are not too easy. And, uh, taking like, I remember uh, some of the quarters I take 20 hours, which was pretty heavy load. And then I work part time too, so, and then play basketball at the same time. Uh, that I didn't have time for anything else. I was home when uh, the news came over the radio. It was really a, a quite a sh shock because like most people didn't ever believe that something like that could happen or was about to happen. My parents didn't have much to say about it. Of course, they didn't know anything about it. Uh, and they didn't try to justify it or tell me that it was right or wrong or, or what. Uh, I did go to school on that Monday and found out that, uh, uh, that the principal had uh, decided that that it would be better if we st we stayed home, Japanese Americans, and uh, so after saying you know kind of goodbyes to some of our friends, uh, I left and came home. If I remember, I went back to school the next day. Uh, I don't think I stayed home more than a day. I just felt just just terribly depressed at that uh, you know at the goings on at that. that my parents' country would would uh, wage war on on my country. The students are all quite uh, quite understanding, and uh, most were fairly friendly. And uh, uh, so I didn't have any kind of confrontations or at all. Uh, I think those students maybe that had a different opinion just avoided, uh, you know, saying anything or or avoided even being around us. Of course, when you're on a basketball team and, and they're all really supportive and, and that was something that I was thankful for. I didn't know how it would be any place else, but in Weber College and University of Utah, I really had uh, the support of my teammates. They were, they were for me, you know, 100% of the time. The executive order came out, I think, uh, after the first of the year. So no one even thought of that sort of happening until that did happen and uh, uh, and it all was very sudden uh, devastating to those people that had to go through that but uh, we were lucky that we were inland and didn't have to uh, you know bear that kind of burden i had a friend that i was chumming around with before the war that moved to los angeles just before the war and then he got interned in the camp in Arizona. And when he went to that camp, of course I kept in contact with him. He said that he could come out of camp if he had a sponsor, someone that would guarantee that he had a, a job and so on. And so the president of school happened to be the father of the guy that used to play center on our football team in junior high school. And so I talked to President Dixon 
about that. He said, sure. He said, I certainly will. So he, he signed the papers to have my friend Roy come out of Poston camp to work at Weber College and, uh, and that he would vouch for him as, uh, as his sponsor. And he stayed out the rest of the time. I'd have been lucky to be on good teams with good guys. Like in uh, basketball, I started out in the ninth grade. We won the ninth grade championship, the only high school championship that Ogden's ever won was the year I was a junior. And then I was going to Weaver College, we won the postseason tournament. And in that one game, he played his best game and he became the outstanding player of the tournament. If I remember correctly, something like 24 points. In those days, that was quite a few points. Well, it was definitely the highest scoring tournament game that I ever played. I was high point man and my best shot was the shot coming across the middle uh, about at the foul line, shooting it just like a foul shot almost. I scored more than half my points I think on that little maneuver. Uh, won me the MVP for that tournament. One of the probably greatest unknown American sports stories in, in our country's history. It's just incredible. It's not just about a guy playing basketball. A nation is testing itself to really see if if its constitution and its democratic values are going to sustain itself, not just overseas and in fighting for freedom and liberty in Europe and in Japan, but can it live here? And through this, there's this guy playing basketball. And I think it's just a great metaphor for this story of what great sports stories are all about. We're talking about the competitive spirit of athletes like Watt Misaka, who played for the New York Knicks back in 1947 the first non-white player in the NBA uh, and who served in the U.S. Army during World War II. Uh, Mr. Masaka is here as well today. There he is. Thank you so much. Thank you.